All right, guys, it is another Sunday Night Live session. I am the editor-in-chief of the Watercraft Journal, the world's most popular personal watercraft magazine, and quickly becoming everyone's favorite video channel. The Watercraft Journal is live this Sunday night, so we are having a good time. We're going to be fielding a lot of questions. As you can see here on my desk are a whole bunch of bits of swag from Kawasaki, SeaDoo, and Specs USA, as well as official Watercraft Journal stickers. I am giving away swag. I'm giving away prizes tonight for the best Super Chat questions. If you have a Super Chat question that you want to ask and it's particularly interesting, you can pick from the pile. This is going to be the grab bag. I'm clearing out my garage. <laughs> Get this crap out of here. So if you got a super chat question, all you have to do is go to the bottom of the chat, hit that little, I guess it's a dollar sign or an S. If you hit that one, make a super chat, put in a good question, you get to pick from the pile. And I'll go over what we got here. But I want to say happy Sunday night. And Billy's here, everyone. So everyone's got to say hi to Billy. You're not allowed to... To leave a comment unless you say hi to Billy. Everyone's got to say hi to Billy. All right. Uh, the other thing is we are still doing the uh, subscriber-only comments. That is not to kick anyone out. What that is to do is to encourage you to sign up and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that we get our subscriptions up because it's a big old high school game and popularity contest. And if we we got to get those we got to get those likes up to twenty thousand, and we got to do it fast. So that's the big thing, guys. Is we definitely, definitely, definitely got to get uh, the Watercraft Journal YouTube channel up to twenty thousand subscribers. When we do, we're gonna have a huge five hundred dollar uh, giveaway. Uh, we got five hundred dollars worth of prizes. We got gift cards. We've got a, a Totally trick life vest from Slippery, and they will take your size and colors, and they'll they'll let you basically pick the one you want. So that's something really really cool for us. Is uh, Slippery is going to be giving away not only a life vest, but like a bunch of like floating key rings and a bunch of floats for your phone. If you're bringing your phone with a little tether, they have a little float for it. Um, We've got, we got swag from the OEs. We got swag from other advertisers. I'm giving away jerseys. I'm giving away shirts. So we definitely need to get, got to get uh, the YouTube channel up to 20,000. And it's not just the new person, but we're going to go through the whole, the whole list. Um, unfortunately, we are restricting for that, for actually for all the prizes that we give out. You got to be continental in the United States. Um, the cost of shipping is just ridiculously stupid and I just can't afford $200 to send a small box <laughs> to New Zealand. So unfortunately it's kind of the world we're in right now. So I apologize. Um, I have mailed stickers to, to Australia with no problem, but I, I just can't send like a, 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 you know, a big insulated, you know, thermal cup across, you know, to Indonesia or to, you know, the other side of the planet. So anyway, that's kind of the big thing going on. We want to encourage people to do super chats. We got our first from Chris. Uh, best question. What is the most annoying question I have ever asked you? <laughs> uh, looking for good handheld GPS for true speed checking and top speed. What do you recommend? Are all GPSs uh, legit? Good question, Chris. Um, for I use two. I use two GPSs. Um, I have a GPS scape from Garmin that I use for my general tracking, general mapping. Um, it does track top speed. It does track average speed. It does not give you really good acceleration numbers. It does not have an accelerometer inside of it. What is an accelerometer? Accelerometer is 
uh, basically a little gyroscope or it has gyroscopic capabilities, doesn't necessarily have a gyroscope in, inside, but uh, can actually feel G-forces in a corner, in a straight line, even breaking. So though uh, that capability is done with my other device, and that's a V-Box. It's the same device that Jerry Gaddis uses, that Greg Gaddis uses for all of their testing. Um, the V-Box communicates to your phone via an app and your phone app is going to have all that information on it but if you're looking for tracking navigation there's a i think there's like half a dozen waterproof uh garmin gps's i prefer garmin i know some lorance are nice but those are hard mounted i know there's some handheld ones too i apologize but I've had such a good relationship and such a good experience with Garmin GPSs. I tend to kind of go with the brands that have never done me wrong. And that will be with a Garmin handheld GPS. And for acceleration testing, speed testing, the most, uh, the most accurate speed testing device has been the V, v box, V box. Okay. Are you saying V box with a V? Yes, a V, V box. All right. Uh, no GPS fish finder combined. You can with a hard mounted system, um, but most people don't want to rewire their ski. Most people don't want to drill into their ski and put in a hard mounted fish finder GPS. Uh, I'm talking handheld devices. Uh, so nine times out of 10, a handheld device would be preferred over someone who's going to hard mount, uh, something onto their ski. You can definitely, it's fine. Uh, but nine times out of 10, someone's going to want the handheld device over something permanent. So I hope that helps. Okay. So. Uh, let's get through the news before I get into the topic. We got some updates. Uh, obviously, everyone who subscribes to the Watercraft Journal is going to notice that everything that I said was going to come out this last week didn't. <laughs> I'm a oh microphone. Holy cow! I'm glad you guys could hear me. I'm glad I'm loud enough. But we definitely want to get the mic in here. Okay. So uh, the big thing was the Panhandle video ride and article. Uh, that one just didn't happen last week. Uh, I got the draft. In fact, the draft is sitting right there. And there is one correction that needs to be made. And it's on a uh, Google Earth graphic that we made tracking our route. And Google Earth took the route and made it all screwy. And we didn't catch it until we were editing the video. And so, unfortunately, that guy has got to get thrown out. And we got it. Uh, my editor is working on getting in the correct graphic. Once that is in, video and article go live. I am planning for Wednesday morning or midnight on Wednesday for the panhandle ride. And when that is done, the write up on the Nolens ride, the battle back to Nolens, which is the New, New Orleans ride, uh, New Orleans, uh, as to over enunciate. Um, that will, the New Orleans ride will go live on Friday. I didn't want to, frankly, I didn't want to reverse the order of those because there was a procession and because I had COVID for a week last month and, um, a bunch of other things just totally got in the way as well as watercraft of the year, uh, our Christmas buyer's guide, uh, traveling for a photo for two photo shoots and attending a uh, major industry event for the other publication that we got, getting sick, and then Christmas and New Year's, I was like, screw it, it's getting pushed back. So I apologize, life happened, life gets in the way, what are you gonna do? So Panhandle Ride and video should be live this Wednesday. Mark that off the list. Nolan's Ride on Friday. Um, in between those two, well, Nolan's ride doesn't have a video, 
But tomorrow, Tuesday, and Thursday are going to be the shorter recaps from last week's or two weeks ago um, about Watercraft of the Year. So tomorrow is going to be on Bronze Winner, which was Fish Pro. Uh, Tuesdays is going to be Silver Winner, which was uh, Super Jet. And then Thursday is uh, discussing the Watercraft of the Year winner, which was the RXPX 300. So if you haven't already read the article or seen the video, I just spoiled it for you. But I give my reasons why in those. So you can check those out this week. And then the last one is finally we got approved for three new colors for the jersey. So the jersey is in a light blue. We are looking at some more dynamic colors, some darker colors, um, stuff that's just a little bit different. So uh, those new jersey colors, we should have an announcement by the end of the week. I don't know if we'll have artwork, but I should have a confirmation on those colors. All right, so uh, we did a little bit of a survey earlier in the week, and it was, you know, like, help us pick a topic, and all of the, all of those topics, more or less, came from people writing me letters, writing me private messages, reaching out through the Instagram page, reaching out through Facebook, um... My team sends those to me, and so I have to look at them and basically give them a, a response, or I'll go in and write a response. Typically, if I write a response, there's going to be a little hash K on it. Um, otherwise, it's going to be, you know, you know, one of the guys reaching out and being like, hey, listen, you know, can you answer this for me, for me Kevin? Okay, fine. Um, every comment on YouTube gets an answer, even if it's like, thanks, bro. But um, Instagram private messages, Facebook private messages, or through my Facebook, you know, Watercraft Journal, Facebook, Watercraft Journal, Instagram, those get sent to me. I'll typically answer them uh, with a K. Otherwise, you're going to hear from my team. But the, um, the topics that I had put up for selection were definitely... <laughs> <laughs> definitely inspired by some emails that came in. And I get a lot of questions about people wanting to modify their skis. And it takes very little. I mean, it really does take very, very little to kind of get a, te a temperature of whether this person really knows their way around anything mechanical. And nine times out of 10, if they're reaching out and asking me, they don't. And that's, that's not necessarily being rude. I'm, I'm trying to be brutally honest. And hopefully it's not insulting. Hopefully it's a little bit of like, okay, well, that's refreshing Kevin's not going to pussyfoot around and be like, well, golly, oh, you know, I really want you to buy some extra parts from our advertisers so that, you know, I look good. I'm going to tell you, listen, dude, you have no place holding a socket wrench. I strongly recommend if you're, if you're diehard, these are the parts I recommend and I recommend, and I strongly recommend you find a shop. Um, otherwise I will probably be like, just leave it alone. Just leave it be. Um, and I'll give you my reasons why. And I'll and hopefully a lot of people will be like, okay, that makes sense. Okay, I get where, where Kevin's coming from. The biggest kind of litmus test is often, do you do the service on your car? Do you change your car's oil? Do you rotate your car's tires? Do you maintain fluids in your car? Are you... Johnny on the spot and maintain your cars. I don't care. I, I don't want to hear it. If you're like, well, I'm so busy because I'm just making it rain and I make so much money that my time is worth more than changing the oil. And so I send it to a shop or I take it to the dealer or blah. I don't want, I don't care. I don't care. All right. The reality is if you don't have time or you're not the guy who's doing those services on your car, 
you're probably not going to be the guy who's going to do any sort of modifications on your jet ski. You're just not. You're going to want someone else to do it. You're going to want the benefit and not the work. Okay. There's one category. All right. There's the willing I'd like to learn, but the, the caution that I have with that person is, do you really want to learn on your $17,000 supercharged sea do Do you really want to cut your teeth on this very expensive <laughs> purchase that you've made and accidentally render your ski inoperable? Do you, is, is this really the time to learn on this? Uh, and most guys who are kind of dipping their toe in the pool go, you know, that, that kind of makes sense. Maybe I shouldn't. Fair. The third, the third reason why I, or the third question or category that I, I typically mention or bring up in talking to people is why. Why? And more often than not, it's, I feel like I'm missing out. Or I feel like I can get more or more or less, I feel like I'm missing out. And that is a dangerous motive. That's a dangerous motive because that turns into I'm going to get into a competition with the guys in my club or the guys in the group that I ride with or I just got to be the fastest guy in the group. And... I've met those guys and more often than not, those guys have more money than brains. Sorry. They often have more money than brains. They, and I've ridden with those dudes. I've been with guys who have thrown money at skis and they have no idea what they're doing. And they effectively destroy their ski and often get hurt. Um, I'll tell this story. I'll tell this story, even though I probably shouldn't. <laughs> and if Greg Gaddis is watching, uh, I apologize because I'm going to share a story that he probably doesn't want me to. Um, Greg had a customer come to him about two years ago, had an RXPX. And he says, man, this thing rides like crap. This, or this thing runs like crap. I want to get this thing going 85 miles an hour and I've got all these other parts on it. And he literally just piecemealed parts from all these different people. I wanted this and I wanted that and I wanted this and all. because he was on Facebook and he's got money. All right. And he has this brand new RXPX, but he just like, Ooh, I want, I gotta have this. I gotta have this. I gotta have this. And he slapped it all on, and the ski ran like garbage. It ran like, you know, high 70s. So Greg gets it, and he goes, this thing's a freaking disaster. This ski is a disaster. Who put this together? This is a mess. So Greg spends months and a lot of this guy's money going, I need, I need to clean up this package. I need to clean this thing up. So he 86 a bunch of parts that this guy had put, had put on. And he put together a really solid stage two package. And the ski ran like 84 and change with Greg on it. Now, Greg's a little dude. I think he weighs about a buck 40 sopping wet. All right. He's a skinny little guy. So this thing just gets up and goes. Just, wah, just goes. Well, the guy who owns it, he's probably my height, maybe a little bit shorter. But he's a big dude. He's a big, heavy guy. Well, the ski runs 80, 81. He throws a fit. And Greg's like, okay, well, let me explain to you difference in weight. <laughs> let me explain to you how you know how much gas I had in the tank versus what you got. And you're gonna see differences. All right. My RXPX, my personal RXPX, if I got a full tank of gas, that thing won't break 69 miles an hour with the SCOM on it. If I've got the alarm going off. And I'm hanging off the back with no back seat. It'll run 75 and change. It'll run 75 and like 75, seven was the best I ever got with me on it. All right. 
So there's a big difference. This guy didn't understand that. And that, when I say those words, I think a lot of you are just laughing, going like, dude, no duh. But he didn't understand how weight affected speed. And he was irate about it. And so Greg took the ski back and did some other work. And he goes, okay, well, how, try this. And he goes, well, it's better. It's like going like 81, 82. Okay, fine. So then the guy goes and he starts hole sawing this, taking a hole saw and start punching holes all through the ski. And he swamps the ski. Swamps it. Fills it up with water. Hydrolocks the engine. And then he yells at Greg. And Greg's like, bro, what did you do? Well, I didn't like the Riva this, and so I put this JP part on, and I changed up this and changed up that. Murdered his ski. So I go back to someone who's got more money than brains. And I strongly recommend in this case, don't let envy ruin your purchase. Guys, these are expensive. These are expensive toys. Don't. Don't cut off your nose to spite your face. It's not worth it. It's not. So, again, I preface this. And I'm sure a lot... I haven't even looked at the comments. I'm sure a bunch of people are like, screw you, I know what I'm doing. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So, um, that is kind of how I'm leading into things. All right. Okay. Chris has another super chat, so let's go to that one. Several shops, Riva, JP Racing, Dean's Team, etc., all do Riva Stage 1, 1, 2, 3, etc., right? If so, is there any difference? Do they flash different, or what makes of each shop are different? If answer later, then I'll wait. Well, okay, that, that that's a heavily packed question. Um, the answer is no. Well, the answer is They'll do whatever you ask them to, okay? Riva will only put on, well, I mean, they have works. They sell works. Um, but when you go to Riva, typically they're going to only use Riva parts or parts that they work very closely with. Nine times out of ten, Riva is going to build you a Riva ski with Riva parts. JP Racing is now getting into making their own tunes, their own parts um, for the most, eh, but then using a lot of everyone else's. Again, JP, if you walk into JP and you say, I want a Riva stage two, or I want a Riva limited stage build, they'll be like, okay, this is what it'll cost you. <laughs> Out the door. Okay. Dean's team will typically do the same as well, but Dean, knowing Dean Cherrier, will be like, you can get a Riva Stage 1. You can get a Riva Stage 2. But I can do it better. <laughs> that's, that's Dean. So Dean will try to talk you into doing something else. As will JP. As will anyone. Okay? Um, but as long as your money's green, <laughs> they'll take your money. And they'll happily take your money and happily put the parts on that you want. Um, here's the problem. Well, let me continue answering your question. Dean has his own tunes. JP Racing has their own tunes. Riva has their own tunes. The question is, okay, what's behind that? What's behind their R&D? I want to know how they got to that part. Okay. Is there an engine dyno at JP Racing? No. It does... Dean have access to a private lake. Dean has access to a limited use lake. Yes. Um, you know, uh, let's see. What professional racers or riders do all of these guys have access to who can go out and do on the water testing? Well, Riva's got a whole pool of people. JP Racing's is JP. <laughs> he goes out and he... He does the acceleration runs. I've never seen him do anything handling-wise. And Dean's got racers. And Dean's got uh, access to very qualified riders. 
So he's able to tweak and modify and do stuff like that. Um, I know Ermin UI and Tosca is signed with Dean, and they do a ton of R&D. Oh, my gosh. They do a ton of R&D. So you got to you gotta consider the source where a part comes from. I do. Hopefully, you guys do as well. So, yes, flashes are different. How do they come up with those timing, you know, those ignition timing curves? How, you know, are... How are they data gathering? How are they? <sighs> There's a lot to consider when it comes to where a product comes from. Okay. Reva Racing, their dyno cell, I've seen the headers, I've seen the exhaust, and they are data gathering from each individual cylinder. No one I know in the continental United States is doing that besides Reva. Okay, they have true, true high end level data gathering that obliterates anyone else. Sorry, they do. All right, I know it makes me sound like a shill for Riva, and oh, I know CRT Racing has this, and JP Racing has this, and and uh, Cal Callus Cal Calais Callus uh, Callus has their engine tunes and their packages. And all these guys have a lot of it. Um, and, okay, fine. Just consider the source. So there's, there's a lot to be considered. And then, yeah, are the shop's mods different? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. And I, I am not, I hardly care about being the fastest accelerating ski out there. I want the best overall balance that works for the machine itself. And that's why there's, I have preferential parts in my head of, I like these guys steering components. I like this guy's ride plate. I like this guy's intake rate, you know, X, Y, Z. Here's where we get into a little bit of a sticky thicket, all right? And that is packages versus piecemeal. Going back to my example, um, that guy had big eyes on Facebook and was like, oh, I need to get this intake, this air intake, and I got to run this impeller. Because everyone's talking about this impeller and everyone's talking about this air intake and everyone's talking about these injectors and this fuel rail and, and oh, maybe. And, and so he's being dragged around by popular opinion. And at no point has anyone done any sort of actual testing with a goofball freaking package like that. Dean's team has proven packages. Dean Charrier will look you square in the face and tell you, your ski is going to run 81 miles an hour on 93 octane at this elevation. I've tested it. My team's tested it. I guarantee it. Revo will look at you and say, that ski is going to run 82.5 miles an hour because we, here is the video of us doing it here is the dyno sheet off of the tune that we did. Here's X, Y, Z to prove it. This is it. Oh, okay. And then you go, yeah, but I want to start modifying this Reva Stage 1 kit. And all of a sudden, this guy pops up on Facebook and goes, I lost a mile and my, my kit only runs 78. Why does it run 78? It's like, well, what did you put on it? Well, I put the Reva Stage 1 kit, but then I put this impeller on. Well, who told you to put that impeller on? Facebook. Gee, I wonder why. Okay. Because you started messing with the package. Don't you think Reva on their private lake and their millions of dollars in R&D considered, hey, maybe we should, should we tweak, should we change the intake rate? Well, let's go find out. And they go out there with a prototype intake grade, and it slows the ski down. And they go, ooh, that's a bad idea. 
But they go out in the ocean, they go, well, we stay hooked up. So this is a good offshore intake rate. Oh, okay. Or hey, let's try this, uh, let's try this impeller. And they put that polished three-blade impeller on there and it picks up a mile an hour. And they go, oh, great, works good. Well, Solus makes this other impeller. Let's try that one. And then it slows it down. They go, oh, well, we don't want that one. We're going to try this one. And now it's part of the package. They've done their testing. But if you contact a company and you go, hey, have you guys ever tried, or have you have any results with this Solus impeller and this ride plate and these sponsons and this tune? They go, dude, no, I got no idea. Then maybe that's not a good idea. Unless you want to be the guinea pig. You can be the guinea pig. Go right ahead and tell everyone what happens. Let us know. We're, we'll all be interested to know what the result is. Um, but make sure you get all the information. Because that's what makes or breaks any of these companies. Okay? PwC Muscle goes out and does testing on parts. Dean's team goes out and does testing on parts. JP, uh, JP, uh, JP uh, Racing goes out there and takes GPS speeds and he goes, okay, the air temperature is this, the water temperature is this. We, the water was, you know, we had one mile an hour or we had five mile an hour winds and, you know, okay, that's my information. And he's getting better day by day. The more, the more he tests, the, the better he gets. And every single one of these guys, every single one of these shops who prides themselves on testing can deliver real results. Okay, JetX Racing up in Canada does testing, even though his elevation is sky high. They all do testing. Any shop worth their salt does parts testing, and they might come up with, "Hey, listen, you know what? I've got a I've got a Frankenstein package, but it totally works out." And I'll tell you why I know this. JetX Racing is a is a Riva installer. Okay, last. Mark Hahn, which is in February, all right. Um, I think it's the I think it's the Sunday after uh, Valentine's Day, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe it's the last Sunday of the month. Um, the guys at JetX Racing had a racer who was like, "I'm going out there on an RXTX 300. I need to be the fastest RXTX 300." And he goes, "Okay, no problem." They go out there with three parts. A tune and a Riva air intake, and I and I think a impeller, a, pri, a, a a custom pitched impeller, and that cat went out there and ran eighty six miles an hour all day long on an RXTX three hundred, and it's because he they up in Canada found. Uh, found the sweet spot for that ski, and then they worked with they worked with Jesus Garcia at Riva, and they said we got to tweak it, we got to tweak it, we got to tweak it, we got to tweak it. And Jesus is like, well, we're testing at zero elevation, <laughs> you know, we're like two feet above sea level, and it's like, well, Havasu is a few hundred feet above Havasu or, or a few hundred feet above sea level. We need something to be tweaked, and then they changed, and then they tweaked it for barometric pressure because it was so damn cold. So suddenly, their testing in Canada was almost identical to what it was. Uh, the barometric pressure in Canada, because of elevation, was almost identical to what was at Havasu in last February. This kid, this kid goes out there and murders. He murders. He absolutely kills it. Okay, testing comes down to testing. And you know what? Riva's not selling the combination or selling the tune or the prop that they messed with, but Jet X is. So again, packages versus piecemeal. Do you want to be the guinea pig? And do you want to be the guy who's trying to figure it out and trying to chip away and chip away and chip away? And how can I shave, you know, how can I shave a tenth of a second off my acceleration? How, you know, where is it falling on its face? Where, where am I bouncing off the rev limiter? Blah, 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 blah. If you're not mechanically inclined, 
you don't want to be that guy because you're like, this ski runs like crap and I don't know what the hell's going on. So if you are the guy who's like, listen, I don't even change my own oil. I want something kind of quick and I will studiously and regularly bring my ski to a shop and I found a shop that I like, go with a package. Go with an established package that has established results so that you can go, hey, you said your kit runs 75 miles an hour. I don't know, you know, 80 miles an hour. Well, I'm only doing 75. What's going on? Okay, well, let's tweak it. Let's find out. Let's work together. That that shop wants your business. That shop wants to keep you happy. They'll work with you. All right. But again, I go back to if you are not comfortable being the guinea pig over here and doing a lot of test and tune and a lot of bad days on the water, which that's what happens. Go with a go with an established package. Go with an established performance package that has established numbers. I strongly strongly recommend this. Okay. So now I skipped over something I need to explain. This is clearly not meant for racers and tuners and guys who are old hats at this. Today's message is clearly not for you. You don't need my opinion. You don't give a rat's ass what I have to say. And that's fine. I don't, I really don't expect you to. All right. This is for really the guy or girl who is like, ah, I want a little bit more out of my ski, or I want to prolong a little bit of longevity out of my ski, or I want to improve the handling, or let's pump some new life into this thing. That's fine. Great. That's really who I'm talking to. I am not talking to the tuner, the racer the guy who's been doing this for 20 years. Again, I can't imagine you would care what I have to say <laughs> in regards to this. Um, so what basic mods, what basic modifications should a novice or beginner consider? What basic mods would I look at as being well first you're you're really not going to void your warranty except for one small thing um and there's ways around that too I'll, I'll talk about it and these are typically the parts that render the best result the most bang for your buck okay um Number one is sponsors. Number one is sponsors. I don't care what ski you're on. Number one is sponsors. Sponsors are like putting really good tires on your car. You got a truck and you like to go off road or you want to start going off road and you put some really good BFG all terrains or some really good off road tires on it makes all the difference in the world. And you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. If you got a little sports car or you, you know, you got a little two-door coupe, you little, you know, or you got a Corvette or something so hot and you put a really bitchin' set of sticky, you know, guy, I mean, you know, Pirelli's on it. You'll be like, holy crap, what a difference. It'll knock your socks off. It is night and day. And a good set of sponsors will do that for your ski immediately. You'll put it on, you'll be like, holy crap. Holy crap. And that is the most responsive cornering, handling, tracking through rough water part you can put on. Guaranteed. Sponsons are easy to put on. Sponsons are easy to remove, easy to put on, uh, quickly replaceable. If you're selling your ski, you put your stock ones on and you're done out the door. 
So I strongly recommend if you're if you're considering anything, go with sponsors. Okay, got got another super chat from Chris. Chris, you got to let me know what prize you want. I, I you're a Kawasaki guy. I've got a wallet, credit card, phone, waterproof holder. I've got a Kawasaki Sport Cup with a nice little flip straw on it. Seals up. It's got a nice rubber gasket on both ends. You'll like it. But you've super chatted three times, so you get to pick your uh, pick your prize, unless you want something else. Um, I do have the Specs Koozie. I also have Specs. I guess bicep warmers. I think these come with a set of sleeves. Yes, they come with a set of, oh, no, no, no. Yes, those are the thick sleeves. So I guess you get the psychedelic sleeves if you want those. And then I've got, ah, I've got thin sleeves if you want those either. I've got some other patterns, but I kind of want to get rid of these first. All right. So to his question, speaking of Sponsons, my K-Speed kit, I think, is shipped next week. The only thing they don't have is Sponsons for a while. Should I wait for theirs or something else for now on your Ultra 310X? Um, I have not tested. You know what? I have because they're R&D racings. I have used both Rivas and I have been on K Speed's adjustable spot. No, I have not been on K Speed's new multi adjustable sponsons. So I cannot speak to K Speed sponsons. All I can speak to is the fact that K Speed speaks Kawasaki better than anyone else on this globe. Um, the Riva sponsons are, to my understanding, Basically identical, if not the same, as the old R&D Ultra Sponsons. Um, Chris wants the... <laughs> Chris wants the wallet credit card money holder, right? Um, I'll take the wallet thing unless you have a wetsuit for a big family. I do not have a wetsuit big enough for you, buddy. Um... Get the get the K speeds then. Um, they're fully adjustable. You're going to be able to really modify and customize your own setup. And if you've got our fuel tank on the back, which I know you own, you're not going to want those blades set down with the back of your ski squatting because it's really going to. It might be it might be a little twitchy with all that weight, so you might bring the blades up. Again, you're going to have to do some test and tune on that one because of all of the availability. So, yes, I would wait for the K-Speeds. Um, you're not on fire. You're not going to some race. You don't have to have it right now. So take a patience pill and, and get the parts when you can. Okay. Um, so, again, for the racer, I am, uh, I'm not talking to the racer. Cross that off. Uh Bang for your bucks. Sponsons number one. <clears throat> the next thing I would strongly suggest is, in many cases, not CDU, because obviously you don't change this on a CDU, but a ride plate. In fact, if you're on a, two, a 2019 to 2021 FX, get Riva's ride plate on it as fast as humanly possible. Or... Um, uh, oh, who's the other guy who makes a really good plate? Crap. He cuts the plates. Um, oh, I'm blanking. He's in South Florida. I can't think of it right now. Guys, uh, Dean makes a decent plate, but um, really good. The the One of the best... Um, and Dean has... Dean has uh, Jim's plate. Thank you. Uh, Dean has Jim cut his plate, if I'm not mistaken, or if he he might have already taken that design and made it his own. Um, but Jim's plate, yes. Thank you very much. 
Uh, the Jim's plate for a lot of people has been the most successful plate um, for the FX. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Everyone's going, Jim, 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 Jim. Um, and the Jim's plate has gets the nose up, and you're not getting the porpoising out of it. So there is there is a lot of... Um, uh, there's a lot of data on the gems plate for the 2019 through 2021 ride plate. The 2022 ride plate uh, is pretty damn great. Uh, it's like really good. Um, Kawasaki, the best plate until recently was from Tim Bushman Racing, TBM. He's out of Oakley, California. And the Tim Bushman plate was just out of sight. And Tim Bushman made his plate for Riva. So you'd go to Riva and just buy a TBM plate. Um, I raced with a TBM plate and loved it. Loved it. Um, but the K-Speed plate is showing really good numbers. So a lot of people are really stoked about that. Now, these plates... Do not work for the new 2022. They don't because the new, the new 2022 has brakes. And so it won't work. <laughs> it won't work. But previously for 15 years or 14 years, uh, the TBM plate and the K-Speed plate are going to be the best ones. Because what the ride plate does is the ride plate corrects a lot of the baked in drag that the OEs put into skis um, because they want to slow the ski down. All right. The ultra is just plow, just snow plows through the water because the right plate is shoving it through the water. Same story with the F, the current or the old FX plate, uh, the pre 2022 FX plate. Uh, GP has done pretty good with updating its ride plates. Yamaha GPs have done really good updating their ride plates, but every time they update it, it's basically ripping off Riva's. So Riva has to make a new one. And every time they do, they just kind of get racier and racier and racier. Um, there are some people who are like, well, I want to kind of make my VX a little bit more fun. I strongly, I, I typically just go, then go to your dealership and order the current GP ride plate. And they go, oh, really? I go, yeah. I mean, if you want to be cheaper, you can like, believe it or not, the Riva plate is cheaper than factory in many cases. Um, so that will be a good option for you. Uh, I kind of, I, I mean, I've talked to a couple of people with VXs who are like, I have a VX HO. What should I do? I go make it a VXR. Or, VXR, uh, make it a GP 1800 RHO. And they're like, well, how do I do that? I go, ride plate, sponsons, number, you know, number one and number two. And if you want engine, well, engine breather, uh, reflash it with the stock, this, you know, the stock 8,000 tune, which it's not going to hit 8,000, but they, they have a naturally aspirated tune for the one, uh, 1.8 liter. And people go, oh, okay, great. And they write me back. They're like, dude, this thing freaking gets out of its way. I mean, I'm keeping up with supercharged guys. I can cut corners. I love it. This thing's great. I go, okay, great. I'm glad you're happy. Um, so that is a really, uh, that's a really good option is a ride plate. See, do you can't change the ride plate. Why can't you change the ride plate? Because that is the heat sink for the cooling system. You don't want to crack into the cooling system on that ski. So leave it alone. All right. Um, for people who do offshore riding, and I will typically I will typically reserve this for people who are doing ocean riding, honestly. Is an intake grate. You can change the intake grate on a Sea Doo, a Yamaha, or a Cowie. You're not getting it. You're not tapping into anything. You're not. You're not gonna break. You're not gonna break into anything. You're not supposed to. 
Um, Kawasaki, Yamaha, and in, an intake grate for the ocean is going to keep your ski really hooked, which means the pump is loaded. It's not unloading the pump, and you're going to hear it go ring and ring out. Okay? Um, that is going to be your best friend. With an intake grate, you are... Uh, it's, a, it's almost imperative for open ocean riding. But I will add a caveat. The 2018 Up three-seater, full-size three-seater sea dews. If you are serious about keeping that ski, you need, need, required, must have Reva's intake rate. Why? Because the tail of the ST3 platform is so flat and so smooth that if you don't have the, even with the sponsons, you will unhook the pump and you will break the tail loose. And so many people have had problems with the ski wandering because the nose catches. The intake rate is going to keep that tail from breaking loose. My testing with that intake rate on an RXTX was revolutionary for me because I was really skittish. I mean, I had the sponsor set at four, and I was on I was on their stage one and a half, their one, you know, like their one plus kit. And going like 83 on it and just ringing it out and ringing it out. And I go, what on God's green earth is keeping this thing glued? And they go, we got a prototype intake rate on it. You can't talk about it. And this was a few years ago. Well, I'm talking about it now. And Reva's intake rate for the ST3 is mandatory hardware. For anyone who wants to go around corners Anyone who wants to do serpentines through the bayou at speed. Now, I'm not talking 35, 40 miles an hour. I'm talking pinned wide open. Pinned. 75, 80 miles an hour. You need that intake rate. You need it. As much as I said sponsons or tires, your intake rate is stickier tires and firmer suspension. <laughs> you guys ever been in a like a Porsche or an exotic car, or even like a Z06 Corvette, or a, not a Viper. There, those things had really soft suspension. But I mean, I talk about like a 993, you know, or a 996 Porsche, where you can literally feel the paint on the road when you change lanes. It goes boom, 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 because the tires and the suspension are so firm. You're like, I'm feeling everything. You want that <laughs> if you're going that fast. Because you want to feel everything on the road. And that intake rate and those sponsons are going to do it for the RXTX, GTX, Fish Pro, Weight Pro. Uh, what am I missing? <laughs> that haul. I strongly, re I strongly recommend it. Okay. Talk about intake rate. This one's tough for me. Engine longevity. Oh, how do I start this one? Oh, we got a... Uh, uh, David asked, what are your thoughts on Gator Glide and other hull coatings? I actually did a whole live session on this topic. And I broke down the science of it. David, I, I really did break down the science of it, and I and I actually talked with OE manufacturers who were who were very very nervous about it, and the reason being, most people want it want to get Gator Glide or other hole coatings for protection. All right, the problem is is that Rhino lining, Linex, Gator Glide a big rubber strip that runs down the center of, of the keel. You have dissimilar 
not similar, dissimilar surfaces. And that is dangerous in a lot of different applications. Most people don't ride like I do. Most people don't. They cruise. They're cruisers. They ride in a group. They go to a location. They pull up on the beach. They open up their cooler. And they have a cold turkey sandwich and a cold beer. And you're not supposed to be drinking while you're on a jet ski. But I know you guys do anyway. I don't drink, so whatever. Um, I'm a teetotaler. <laughs> um, but... You're doing it for basic protection of your hull. Well, first and foremost, stop beaching your skis. For the love of God, stop beaching your skis. Please stop beaching your skis. Number two. And I know I'm a hypocrite because I have pictures of me doing it. Anyway. Um, number two. At speed, your hull is having a dynamic relationship with the surface of the water. And when you start having dissimilar surfaces, you can, you can erratically behave. Your hull can erratically respond and you will lose traction and you can be thrown and you can be hurt. I strongly recommend not messing with it. Strongly recommend not messing with Gator Glide, Rhino Liner, and Line X, and all these different things. Um, please, re please refer to our previous videos, Dave. Um, it's okay. I, I, I do tons of it, but I talk about it in like a ton of detail. Um, so okay, uh, let's go back to engine longevity. There is one part in particular that is factory stock on Kawasaki's. It's an oil separator. It is an oil separator. And the oil... Oh, David! David, you gave me a super chat? What of these lovely items... Doing my best Vanna White. Which of these lovely items would you like? We have. I'll give you four... Watercraft stickers. By the way, guys, I found before we changed the name to the Watercraft Journal, we were called Watercraft Performance, and I found a dozen of our original stickers. <laughs> They're pretty cool. David wants the sleeves. Woo! I get rid of these. All right, David, please email me at info at watercraftjournal.com. Please info me your mailing address, and I will ship these to you. They're yours. Get them out of my garage. Okay. Okay. So. Huh. Kawasaki has what's called an oil separator. An oil separator is not. I'm going to make all sorts of people upset about this. Is not the same thing as a catch can. They effectively do the same thing, but they operate slightly different. And I am using the current colloquial definitions of what catch cans are within our industry. If we were, go to the, if we were to go to the automotive industry, people would be like, Kevin, you're out of your mind. They're interchangeable. Fair enough. All right. An oil catch can and an oil separator is imperative to the longevity of your personal watercraft. Particularly with any ace, with, well, besides the spark, because it's not really creating that much atmospheric pressure, but any supercharged ace engine needs it, must have it, must. Mandatory hardware. Mandatory hardware is a oil catch can or an oil separator. Currently, nobody sells an oil, a true oil separator for the Sea-Doo or the Yamaha. They just don't. 
They sell couch cans. Oh, um, Pirate. Pirate, uh, it's a super chat. Does rear exhaust on a sea dude do anything except make the ski loud? Nope. Through hole exhaust, you know what it, the through hole exhaust does for your sea dude? Reduces its value, its resale value. All right. Um, a uh, uh, free flow exhaust, like a Riva free flow exhaust. Uh, Everyone wants to talk about back pressure. Oh, all the back pressure. Oh, the back pressure. Back pressure, back pressure, back pressure. The back pressure produced is not enough to necessitate taking a hole saw to your ski. I have strongly recommended if you're if you are dead set on putting exhaust on your ski, doing the free flow exhaust. Now as I say this, I am talking to primarily people who are doing a stage one kit, a reflash or less. If you are doing a stage two or higher, um, because even limited class is not as modified as stage two, if I'm not mistaken. Stage three, yes. Stage two, Sort of. And I'll tell you why. Because the minute you get into the supercharger, you change the wheel, you uh, start milling the housing. Then what happens is you start producing more PSI. You start producing more boost. And that boost starts producing all that back pressure that Reva's talking about. So... Pirate, to your question, it the answer is no and yes. <laughs> yes and no. No and yes. It depends on how far you're modifying your ski. If you're stage two or higher, or you're putting a turbo on it, you got to have it. It's mandatory. You got to have it. If you're... Uh, stage three is okay for limited in the IGSBA. I think it's the other way around. But the rule book is so monkeyed anyhow. I, I I haven't committed any time to going over the rule book in a long, long time. So, Pirate, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Um, for most people, you're not going to need it. You're making noise. You're just obnoxious. Um, for people who are serious about making some really serious power, high 80s and higher, you're going to want it, you know, to consider an exhaust system. Um, so I hope that helps. Okay, and we're going, and David, you had a super chat, so you get a pick from our pile of swag. We've got a Sea Dew for Life Minnesota plate. It's really exciting. <laughs> we have a Sea Dew Who Rag. We have a Sea Dew Tumbler that you pull the lid off, and it's got a little for a straw. And it's a thermal tumbler. It's actually really cool. Um, all right. We have a Kawasaki tumbler. We have a Fish Pro gilt flop hat that probably needs to be washed because it's been in, in a tub in my garage for a while. Um, <laughs> we've got – oh, the Kawasaki wallet has been claimed by Chris. Um, koozies. I think I've got more sleeves. And I've got more koozies. Holy cow. All right. Let's take a look. We've got... We've got a Sunset Beach theme set of sleeves. Um, we've got... Uh, one snakeskin sleeve and one underwater amphibian. Oh, they're both amphibian. The, okay, these are a set. But one looks like a snake and one looks like it's underwater like in kelp. <laughs> so that can be yours, Greg. We have a uh, gasoline-themed 
Uh, face hood, you know, who rag. That one can be yours. Uh, <laughs> what else do I got? Got another beer koozie with a matching with a matching face diaper. Yay. <laughs> Yay. You can go outside because Dr. Fauci said you have to wear your diaper. Okay. Um, and then I haven't even opened this one. I don't even know what it is. Uh, let's look at this one. What is this? It's, a, it's another, it's another who rag. So Greg, let me know what you want. Greg, sorry. You said supercharged after I sent it. Oh, Greg's okay. Uh, I didn't answer Greg's question. I'm talking to Pirate. Sorry, sorry. This is Pirate. Pirate gets to pick. Um, Sea Doo Tumbler. Okay, the Sea Doo Tumbler has a box. Greg, I keep seeing Greg. Pirate, send me your shipping address, and I will send this out to you. Um, this is for that. This is for that. Don't worry, guys. I'll be organized in a second. Uh, while I get organized, get my likes up to 100. I'm giving away free crap here. Get my likes up to 100. All right. Let's see here. What else we got? That's trash. Um, got that. Got that. Got that. We got all sorts of stuff from specs. All right. Um, okay. Now I want to answer Greg's question. Greg's question says, oh, never mind. After I sent it. Well, thank you for the super chat, Greg. But I'm happy to answer it. Um, do, does the oil catch can do anything for naturally aspirated skis? It does, but it's not as it's not nearly as beneficial. And I'll tell you why the oil catch can is beneficial. All right. I did a whole video on this one. I mean, a long, really detailed video. The inside, your engine is a giant air pump. It sucks in air. It pushes air out. The byproduct is it spins a shaft that helps propel something. <laughs> All right. That's as simple as I can make it. All right. This is basic auto shop. And the problem is that inside of that air pump, as your piston is going, this is my Keith Black Hemi piston that I've had on my desk for since I started my career. As your piston is going up and down inside of the engine, all right, and you know you have a connecting rod, my elbow is the crank, and it's going up and down. Below the piston and in where all your oil is swirling around, it starts to create air pressure. It starts to create a lot of air pressure, especially if the seal around the piston is not very good. All right, I, I'm really making this basic, okay? What happens is, let's say a supercharger is pressing all of this air on top of the piston. And air and gasoline is being blown past the rings on the piston and filling up the crankcase, where the crank is and all the oil, with air pressure and contaminated air, for that matter. You get what's called positive crankcase pressure. Okay? And that positive crankcase pressure can start really harming the inside of your engine, okay? It can, it can hurt the combustion process. It can hurt the oiling process. It's bad news, okay? So engines have what's called a positive crankcase vent, or positive crankcase valve, a P PCV valve, okay, or a PCV valve. The V is a valve, okay. Well, the problem is, is that that pressure that's inside of the engine needs to get out. It's got to be evacuated out. So engineers, Sidu, Cowie, Yamaha, they go, well, how can we siphon? How can we go? and suck that crankcase pressure out. Well, they go, I know, we'll run a tube from the crankcase to the intake, the air intake, and as the engine is sucking air in, which it's literally sucking air, like you put your hand over the front of your throttle body, you go, it'll, it'll try to suck, all right? As it's pulling air in, we'll tie that tube right to the air intake, and that air intake will suck 
all that positive crankcase pressure out and suck it right through the throttle body. Okay? So we'll recycle air. Hey, it works great, right? That's a great idea. Well, the positive, the, the pressure inside of the crankcase wants to push out anyway. So it's already got some speed coming out, out of the valve. And then the air intake is sucking. So as the air starts to slow down out, you know, coming out of the tube, out of the crankcase, through the tube, now the suction on the other end goes, okay, and we're going to pull it out. So now you have a complete circuit of air. Okay? That's important. Now, here's the problem, though. Here's the problem. Is that positive pressure inside of the crankcase in the case of the Kawasaki and in the case of the Sea-Doo is often really contaminated. It's contaminated with spent oil and unspent gasoline, gasoline that hasn't burned and a lot of carbon. So what they're trying to do, what the, what Rotax and Kawasaki are trying to do is get that air pressure or that air that's blowing past the pistons out of the crankcase as fast as possible because they don't want that carbon and unspent gas mixing in the oil. Okay, guys, I got three super chats here from Michael, Duper, and John, and I'm going to get to you, but I want to finish talking about the Greg's question because it gets immediately to uh, a, a part that I want to talk about. And that is, so... In these instances, what's happening is that that gassy, that contaminated, gas-filled, dirty, and typically oily air is being sucked out of the crankcase and pulled in through the throttle body or through the, in through the intake, through the supercharger, into the throttle body, and into the, and into the combustion chamber. All right? So you, in the CDU's case, you could be coating your valves and your intake and your supercharger with a lot of, and your, and your intercooler, I forgot that, with this oily miasma of crap, okay? Cowie said, no, 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 we don't want to do that. That's a bad idea. So we're going to have an oil separator. And what happens is that it's a it's a box, it's a sealed box that has a the the positive crankcase pressure goes into one end and then it's sealed and then there's some baffling inside so that the oil can collect and not float up to the top and then from the top it goes in through the intake. So you're getting the air pressure out, you might be getting some of the fuel molecules, but you're definitely not getting the oil or nearly as much as the uh, of the oil that was coming out of the crankcase and through the intake. Reva sells what's called an oil catch can. And the oil catch can is a clear plastic bottle with a little petcock valve at the bottom so you can drain it out into like a coffee can or whatever. Um, and the petcock, or I mean, pfft, sorry, uh, the clear plastic bottle has an air filter on it and it caps off the intake. So what happens is that the catch can is solely relying upon the pressure inside of the crankcase to get that air out to the bottle. And the bottle collects the oil and then you drain out the oil and Bob's your uncle, you're done. Here's the problem. In having, and I have visual aids, in having a little air filter on there, you're letting the air escape. Okay, the air, you know, the crankcase pressure escapes. Okay, fine. That's good. We're getting the really bad positive crankcase pressure out of the crankcase. That's a good thing. But we're relying upon 
the atmosphere, the positive atmosphere inside of the crankcase to push all that bad stuff out. At no point is there any suction pulling it out. So Riva had this catch can for years. Sea dews, primarily sea dews. And um, then JP Racing, who uh, said, hey, we're going to make a catch can. I said, oh, great. He's going to make a true oil separator. Nope. He made an aluminum version of Riva's catch can. It's almost no different. It's just that it's shiny and it's aluminum. And I was like, this means that there's there's no one's understanding what's happening here. That neither of these guys understand what's happening here. That's what that means. And that's frustrating. Now, I talked to Riva and Riva said, well, the problem is that when you start like putting a turbo kit on and when you start putting like our triple X supercharger wheel on it an oil separator starts pushing it starts pressing so much pressure through it that the oil separator doesn't have enough time or doesn't have an, a, the ability to keep that oil from going all the way into the intake and I'm like okay I'll buy that and JP deals with so many turbo kits and high-end kits and triple X superchargers and things like that, that I, I gave him the benefit of the doubt too. And I go, okay, well, that makes sense. All right, fine. But here's the problem. Most people aren't doing those mods. Most people aren't. They just aren't. Most people are doing really mild modifications. So they're not getting the full benefit of an oil catch or an oil separator and they're just getting a catch can. So I took it upon myself last year to start shopping around and start modifying and tweaking and fabricating and oh god all this time and effort into making a true oil separator that would service most people who aren't going to go all the way to a high boost application. But then I realized well, I'm just going to go automotive and the automotive level kit can handle high boost applications because they're going on Whipple supercharged Mustangs and Hellcats. So I came up with this. This was going to be my catch, my oil separator. And this little guy is what's used on, uh, Hellcats, Hellcat Dodges. And I'll tell you why I like it. Number one, comes with a dipstick. So you know how much oil is in it. I was like, oh, that's great. Number two, there's no pet cock. I mean, there's a drain, but there's no need. You just... Pull that off, take it out, drain it out, wipe it out with a paper towel, screw it back on. But here's the other half of this. I wanted to explain wh why a catch can is inferior to an oil separator. Because what does a true oil separator do? It separates the air from the oil. Derp. Okay. Well, I don't know why I screwed this on. I got to show you inside. First, look inside of there. You need, here. Now you can see. That steel wool element in here is first to stop the oil that's coming in. And how do you do that? How does the oil come in? It has an, a billet A in fitting with a rubber gasket. Out of, the P out of the crankcase, PCV valve, and a rubber hose goes into here. Contaminated oil-filled air goes through here. Goes through that element. I don't know why. Again, I don't know why I screwed this on. 
from that element goes to a secondary filter. This is only just to separate the air from the oil. That's really it. Okay. It's not going to, it's not going to do everything. It's not going to be perfect, but it's the best you got. So then as you have a pressurized oil separator, now full of pressurized atmosphere that is separating the oil from the air, then you've got this big hole right there. Another AN fitting with a gasket. Plug a hose into it, and the hose goes to the, the factory air intake nipple. Now you have a complete circuit. You have pushed crankcase, positive crankcase pressure going into here, being filtered, and then cleaner, non-oil rich air going back through the air intake. And this is for high boost applications. I reached out to the manufacturer of this and I said, hey, I'd like to sell these to jet skiers. And he starts laughing. He goes, you gotta be kidding me. And I explained what was going on with the Sea-Doo engines and he's like, okay, dude, yeah, here's my, here's my price. You're a vendor. He sent me all the little, he sent me filters for it. I go, I don't want the filter. Here's your money. I'm like, I sent them back. I'm like, I don't want the filters. And this was going to be the kit that I wanted to sell. And everyone I talked to is like, dude, that's brilliant. And dude, you're going to lose Reba. <laughs> <coughs> and I was like, yeah, probably. And I don't want to do that. So this system works. It was what I had on the RXPX for a long time. That's why I was all oily on the inside. Because the CDs need it. And I'll tell you why. CDs need it more than any other manufacturer because the pistons inside of the CDs do not slide inside of a steel of a steel sleeve. They slide inside of an electroplated sleeve that the rings are slowly over time shaving the sides off of <laughs> and opening up the tolerances. So C -Doo, the supercharged Sea-Doo engines are getting all of this blow by because it literally blows by the piston and generates all that crankcase pressure. So I recommend everyone put a catch can on a supercharged Sea-Doo. Here's the funny thing. Both JP Racing and Riva just came out with an oil catch can for Yamahas. Well, here's the problem. The Yamahas don't have the problem. There is a PCV valve that runs from the crankcase into the intake manifold. I challenge any hardcore Yamaha guy to tell me that they had complete and total blow-by and they've oiled down their intercooler and their supercharger. They haven't. They haven't. They just simply, the, the SVHO engines do not have the engine blow by. They don't, all right? In most cases, in a crankcase breather, if you got to put a mod on it, fine, put a crankcase breather on it. But I don't like that because I don't like cutting, I don't like deadheading the circuit. I like completing the circuit. This completes the circuit. Anyway. So I, I literally got on the horn with Greg Gaddis and I was like, what the, what, what are they thinking? And he goes, they just want to compete. They just want to compete with each other. They don't want people going to the other guy. That's it. And I'm like, that sucks. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's literally, they're selling, they're selling shiny baubles to people who don't know better. So I'm just letting you know. Um, but an oil catch can is good. An oil separator is better. All right, let's get to these super chats that I have totally passed by because these poor guys have been waiting. Michael Shortino writes, stupid question probably, but how come no one has made an aluminum ski? Um, uh, there's a company out of uh, out of Alaska that makes an aluminum hulled ski. I believe it's a spark that they make. And uh, they do it because you can go over rocks and go over you know, real shallow creeks and all sorts of crazy stuff like that. Uh, manufacturers don't probably for the same reason, 
because they don't want people going over rocks and going up real shallow creeks. And boy, if you thought the environmentalists hated us now, can you imagine what happened if Sea-Doo started selling aluminum skis and every Tom, Dick, and Harry started going up shallow creeks and beaching these stupid things? Dude, the EPA would have us for lunch. So, Michael, I appreciate the super chat. You can pick any one of these lovely gifts, but boy, I think it'd be a really bad idea. <laughs> All right. Duper Schmooper writes, thoughts on piggybacking ECMs like Power Commander. Looking to switch to E85 this winter. Uh, no, it's not Pooper. It's Duper Schmooper. Sorry, buddy. Uh, Dupe, I know nothing about piggybacking ECMs. The only time I've ever ridden an E85 ski was um, uh, Claude Clayton's, like... 2016 E85 ski, which was capable of like 83 miles an hour at the time. I got it up to 80. Um, it was fast. I've been on fast skis and it was built for close course. So, you know, there's that. The problem was the water was really rough when I, when I rode it and it just was a hairy experience. Um, I think the switch to E85 is obscenely overrated. Uh, I think your ability to find fuel out on the water is nil. And I think you'd be doing a, yourself a really big disservice. But um, I just don't have any information to offer you more than that. So I apologize. Uh, and you too get to pick from these lovely giveaway items so email me what you want and your shipping address if you're in the continental united states if you're outside of the continental united states you get a bunch of stickers all right last one john bobbitt um ooh, john bobbitt that's a name all right i'm waiting on my fxho with audio should be here in march what trailer is the best trailer to tow a ski with Probably a dual trailer if I get another ski. They're all the same. Um, well, that's not true. I shouldn't say that. Um, I have a dual bunk uh, Magic Tilt aluminum trailer. If you can afford aluminum, get aluminum 100%. If you can afford an aluminum trailer, get an aluminum trailer, and you'll never look back. You'll love it. Um Trail Ride makes a good one. If you're getting, well, you're getting a Yamaha. Uh, I know Sea-Doo has their Move trailers. They're great. They're very nice. They're not built by Sea-Doo. I think they're they're white labeled. I think from Trail Ride. I think so. Um, I like torsion bar suspension more than Leaf Spring. Uh, Leaf Spring, you get a lot of unsprung. Uh, response, you get a lot of bouncing. Torsion bar suspension is a little more dampened. So I prefer that. Um, build quality wise, most aluminum trailers are pretty much equal. Uh, then you're going to be looking at your winching. Uh, the Magic Tilt has the... Uh, uh, has the tensioned flexed. It's like a flex bar with the uh, with the bumper on it. Other guys have a rigid bumper. Um, my biggest concern is making sure that there's no points of contact of metal to your ski. So you're just going to have to look at that closely. But Trail Right and Magic Tilt have been very good to me. Uh, there might be some other guys who have other suggestions. John, thank you for the super chat. If you'd like, what's the email again? I will take the green cowie tumbler. All right. Uh, Duper, the email address is info at watercraftjournal.com. If you go to watercraftjournal.com, you will you can just go to contact us, 
or, or about us, and you'll see my email there. It's easy. Um, I'm very easy to get a hold of. All right. Uh, all right. Oh, we got another server chat. Okay, here we go. What is the best way to help another rider off a sandbar or grass? Uh, is it safe to use the front or rear cleat to pull my seat? <gasps> no. Uh, my husband and I stopped to help, but it's just backbreaking to lift these skis. Do not, under any circumstances, and I mean that like yelling at my children, making a terrible, possibly injurious mistake, do not do that under any circumstances. Bad. Bad monkey. Bad. <laughs> Woo! Um, yeah, please don't ever do that. That, And I'll tell you why. It's not designed. All right? Your, the fiberglass of your hull is not designed to take any sort of tension like that. You will rip those D rings right out of your right out of your hull, and I've seen it. In fact, I saw it this week. I had a very nice man reach out, and he says, "I have some cracking on the back of my Yamaha hull," and I said, "Really? Well, send me some pictures." So he sent like two or three pictures, and the two D rings on the back of his transom had cracks running vertical and then cracks running like this in towards the pump. But here's the difference with the cracks. They were not just paint cracks. They were stress fra fractures where you could tell that the D-rings had been pulled to the point, excuse me, I did it backwards, that they split, that they got pulled out. You know, if the D-ring was right here, kind of poking out, the fiberglass got pulled out and split. And I said, this is not Yamaha's fault. This is your fault. And he got very upset. And I said, you either ratchet-strapped the crap out of the back of your D-rings on your trailer, or you didn't strap it down, strap the ski down on the trailer hard enough and either accelerated too hard or brake hit the brakes too hard. And your ski moved so hard that the straps yanked outward on both sides simultaneously and pulled on it. And he says, No, 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 that's not the case. And I said, Did you try to tow anything heavy? No. The only time you ever used those D-rings was strapping it down. Yes, you did this. And I go, and I'm sorry, but I'm pretty sure Yamaha warranty is going to tell you the same thing. And he goes, well, I'll keep you posted and tell you what Yamaha says. I said, hey, <clears throat> be nice, be friendly, say I'm really concerned, but I've got some cracks showing up on the back of my ski. I don't know how it happened. And maybe they'll help you out. I said, but... I'm looking at the pictures, and boy, I think he got some bad news. And he was like, oh, wow. Okay, if you say so. So I've seen that kind of stress fracturing happening, Roz. And I'm very sorry, but that's scary. Um, all right, last one. Of the easy mods. I can't believe I'm going this late. But the last one I recommend. If you're a Sea-Doo owner. Get a SCOM. Kawasaki's have SCOMs. A SCOM is a speed control override module. What that means. Is that. Between the dashboard. And the ECU. The computer that runs the engine. There's a wire. <laughs> or a series of wires that communicate information back and forth. And part of that communication is the speedometer saying, Kevin's going this fast. And they go, oh, the computer says, that's fine. He's okay to go that fast. But then Kevin goes 69 miles an hour, or 68 miles an hour, or even hit 70. And that communicates to the computer. Uh, the computer goes, 
uh-oh, he's not supposed to go that fast. Let's slow him down. And then the computer sends a signal up to the throttle control, and the throttle goes, oh, we're going to back off. And that same signal goes to, well, actually, it doesn't even go to the throttle control. It goes to the throttle body and manually shut, you know, slows down the engine. All right. A speed control override module interrupts that signal between the speedometer and the computer and says, no, Kevin's doing fine. It's okay. You don't have to do, you don't have to do anything. And the ECU goes, okay, that sounds fine. <laughs> Hope you guys are having fun with this. Um, and <laughs> that speed control module says, no, man, it's cool. He can go 74, 72, whatever. And the ECU won't interrupt it. And, oh, well, actually, it's communicating on the other end. It's not interrupting from the speedometer to the computer. It's the computer to everything else going, we need to slow him down. And the, and the scum's going, nah, it's cool. Go for it. All right. Ultra supercharged Cowies can use a SCOM. CDUs use a SCOM. Yamaha, you got to reflash it. But here's the trick. Reva's got a tune called the Stock 8000 tune. And the Stock 8000 tune is the exact same acceleration curve as what's in the ski bone stock. The only thing it changes is the speed control and how long the engine can be off, it can be running at RPM at 8,000, eight, it's like 8,040, 8,060. All right. A SCOM simply lets the engine run free. It's no longer restricted. Okay. That's typically as far as I tune my skis. A 75 mile an hour sea do with a good set of sponsons with a SCOM, an oil catch can, is pretty much what I'll ever need. 75 is great. 75 is comfortable. 75 is pretty, you know, pretty trick. I don't need to go 80. I don't need to go 83. There's guys out there going 88, 89, 90 miles an hour. I've gone 90. Okay. Most of my riding, oh, a patch of glass. <sighs> okay. I, I tickled 80. Great. Are you going 80 offshore? Nope. But an untethered, you know, an, un an untethered Sea-Doo or an untethered Yamaha or an untethered Cowie out in the ocean? Let's see if you can hang on. All right, we got a super chat from Thomas. Thomas writes, uh, SCOMs and the X package won't work together, will they? I have the Ski X package on an RX TX300 for towing tube and like the extra data, etc. distance, time, empty. Uh, a SCOM, a SCOM literally hooks into the diagnostic port. So as long as your diagnostic port is open, you can use a SCOM. Look on your RXTX, pull the seat off, and I want you to look at your diagnostic parts. The little plug, the little orange grommet around there, and you can watch my video of installing a, a SCOM on an RXTX 300 and go, oh, there it is. Oh yeah, it's open. I guess I can use a SCOM. Check that one out. SCOM, I know you meant SCOM, it's okay. Uh, but the, you're telling me the X package uses that? Does the X package still have the diagnostic port? It plugs into the diagnostic port. Does the X package have its own port or have its own little plug coming off of it for the dealer to be able to plug in? It should. Last time I saw one, it did. Because if it does, you can hook it up there. Otherwise, no, your SOL, take the X package off and put a SCOM on or choose not to run a SCOM. I'll have to check. Okay. Uh, last time I last time I saw one, uh, an X package, it had a little port.
because every dealer needs to get its hands on that diagnostic port to plug in and do service. So unless something changed in the last probably three years, four years, maybe it's been four years. God, when was the last time I saw one? Maybe three years. Um, it had a it had a port. It had a way to for the dealer to plug in. Uh, yes, they do. Thank you, Cap. Appreciate it. Andrew writes. Added an intake grate and SCOM to my RXTX this summer. Got 79 miles an hour. A few weeks later, my ski is broken and has been sitting at the dealership for the past three months. I don't believe the mods caused the issue. Just unfortunate timing. Andrew, do you know what failed on the ski? Uh, DC just wrote, Andrew, what broke? What broke? You're going to have to give me more information than that. That's like my wife coming home going, the car is making a sound. Okay. <laughs> what does it sound like? So, all right. Dealer doesn't know. Check supercharger, intercooler, et cetera, with no fix. Andrew, what did it do? Did it catch on fire? Did it die? Did it send alarm codes? What codes did it send? Did snakes come pouring out of the engine compartment? What did it do? <laughs> okay. The... Try new plugs, diagnostic tuner, no help. You're not telling me anything. <laughs> what did the ski do? <laughs> uh Compression test, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, Andrew, I appreciate the super. Uh, uh, I appreciate the super chat, but the no fire, loss of power, wouldn't pass five thousand RPM, bogging down, laggy boost. All right. <laughs> Sorry, not a fast typer. Andrew, do me a favor and email me. Email me, and I'll and I'll and I'll I'll. I'll happily discuss this over email. I uh, no, no, it's okay. Don't don't apologize. Um, but this take, I think this is going to take a lot more information. So why don't you email me and we'll carry on the conversation. But because of your super chat, you can get some koozies, some face masks, a Sea-Doo Fish Pro hat, a Sea-Doo Who rag for your face. Um, I got some sleeves, some UV sleeves. Uh, I have a very cheap little Minnesota Sea-Doo for Life plate that I just dropped under my desk. Oh, here it is. Okay. <laughs> Jeez. Everyone get to look at the top of my head. All right. <coughs> Duper. All right. To ceramic coat pistons or to not ceramic coat pistons, that is the question. What do you think? Any experiences? What about a wide band on an ultra? Oh, well, wide band is good for tuning. Yeah. You always want to know your air fuel. This is a coated piston. People ceramic people ceramic coat the tops of pistons all the time. So here's I could wheel out an engine or bring the camera in here and or out to the garage and show you engines I've built. Um, this has been an awesome video. One more hour? No, I'm out of here in two hours. Uh, there's no way. A um, lot of a lot of hot rod builders ceramic coat the top of the piston, okay, or heat treat the top of the piston. They also ceramic coat the skirt because they want that they want that wicking. That oil wicking property. I've also seen people coat the the inside the underside of the skirt for the same purpose to get that wicking out there. This has been treated because it's an alcohol hemi piston. All right, it's for it's for you know top fuel. Um, this is a very expensive piston. <coughs> Excuse me, but there's a lot of people who ceramic coat pistons. Um, you just got to find a really good, like jet hot, you know, level heat treating coder. If you can find someone who coats at those high levels, you can do it. Are you going to see major gains? 
Well, it depends on how modified your engine is. A stock engine, no, you're not going to see jack. It's not going to do a damn bit of good. All right. Um, longevity, oh yeah. Unless, of course, the coating starts flaking off, and then oh, you got all sorts of other problems. Um, most people who ceramic coat the heck out of their pistons and and the heck out of the the insides of their engines. Um, are not building engines that are designed to rack up a hundred thousand miles, if that makes sense. So, Duper, thank you for the super chat. It's a very good question. Um, I'm dipping a little bit into my my muscle car magazine <laughs> tech, but yeah. Uh, now, I mean, the custom engine builder. Oh, you know what? I've heard really bad results. Um, really, had an injector fail and melt a piston. Um, wow, I can't believe the duty cycle on that injector would fail. That's surprising. Mm. But if the injector failed, you would have no ignition. And so why would it melt the piston? Unless it was still trickling or if it was dumping fuel. Ooh, that's scary. Yeah, well, piston, if piston melted, piston melted. I'm just trying to figure out um, the sequence of events that made it happen. Okay, so SCOM is really, SCOM or a stock tune is often what the most I recommend for most folks. Again, I know I'm not talking to hardcore performance people, and I know I'm not talking to tuners and racers. All right? But um, that, you know, this list has been primarily for people who are the casual, you know, casual performance enthusiasts. Got a super chat from Greg. I typed the question. But it's long, but it's so long. This is for when I potentially harass you later. Sorry. Even if I don't bother you later, I actually I bother you enough already. <laughs> ah, just email me your super long question. Just email me, you just email me your super long question. That's fine. Um, I'm gonna go back up a little bit, but to be honest, I've answered a lot of questions and we're already at a at a buck forty seven. So I don't even really think I wanna keep dragging on. Um, I know this has been a fun one, but because uh, I like talking about car stuff. Uh, but Greg, insulting. Oh no, I know nothing. I learned it all from you. This is why I'm here. Duh. Um, <laughs> oh man, you you got a shirt made after you. Uh, kind of. I don't know what's going on here, but it sounds like you girls are fighting. And keep your fighting out of my chats. All right. Um, In my okay, Jason writes a good question or a good statement. In my opinion, modified skis are always more difficult to sell. The buyers always wants to know if it's done right. Jason Bourne is 100% correct. Modified skis have a lower resale value than a bone stock ski. Because I won't buy a modified I personally won't buy a modified ski from most anyone because I don't trust most uh, the majority of people who think they know how to build something. Would I buy a race ski? No. Would I buy a modified ski? Depends on who it was. It's reality. Um, and Jason's correct. And you can look at Facebook Marketplace. You can look at Craigslist. You could look at any number of uh, any number of classified sections. Modified skis sell for way less than a bone stock ski, like considerably less. And and if they're listed higher, they'll be ground down. It's guaranteed, um, unless you are buying somebody's purpose built hot rod. That's just like you know, like you know, Griorgi Kaza's race ski. That some guys like I got to go ninety miles an hour, ninety five miles an hour around a close course. I'll buy Griorgi's ski 
then okay, fine. Um, you know, Riva Racing sells their Riva limited edition skis for like twenty six thousand dollars, and they all go like 83, 84, 85 miles an hour. But it's a it's a package. It's a done deal. So uh, nine times out of ten, a modified ski will sell for way less than a box ski. Um, that's just the way it is. Uh, all right. Do, 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 do. Doing your homework, like watching Kevin, will keep you from doing something stupid. No, it won't. <laughs> no, it won't. It'll just be something stupid that Kevin recommends. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I got, okay, Jason writes, I got eight miles per hour on just the Map Tuner X on my 21 GPR. They advertise it correctly. I always buy from Green Hulk. Uh, can get Riva parts with a discount. Yes, in fact, the discount is green is literally Green Hulk, and it's ten percent off. You heard it from me first. Uh, you heard it from me, folks. All right. Exhaust adds more sound than uh, than top end. I'll never run a loud ski. I'm hitting I'm hitting eighty four with complete stock exhaust. Done. Yeah, that makes sense. Um. Let's see here. Boy, Jason, Jason's got a lot to say tonight. Uh, all right. Do, 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 do. Okay, Kevin writes, Hey, Kevin, I know you said the old FX Cruiser covers won't work with the rec deck, but do they make an... Updated cover for the 2022 skis, or are we stuck taking that deck on? Oh no, no, no! There is a there there is a dedicated cover for the FX that is equipped with the rec deck. The rec deck is really not recommended to be removed and put back on, and blah 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 blah. Uh, not so much, at, not so bad as the uh, uh, Fish Pro deck, but the rec deck can be taken on and off. It, it and the process is rather simple. It's just heavy and awkward, like me. All right, uh, <laughs> all right. Um, no, Kevin Monster, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking. Uh, Ed writes. It seems like Riva has a lot, a lot on back order right now. I've been waiting on a set of uh, a seat cover since summer. And intake grape for a couple months, even though they said it ships in mid-December, still waiting. Uh, I believe their seat covers come from Jet Trim out of uh, Lake Havasu. Uh, they apparently hate the Watercraft Journal. Uh, they hate our 500,000 half million readers. And they hate our 1.8 million YouTube viewers. And just do not want to access our two and a quarter million people. Um, I don't think that's a good business practice, but they won't answer my phone calls or emails. So, oh well. Uh, and their intake grate uh, is has to come from the foundry, and you know foundries are being killed by the current administration. Just ask California's foundries, because California does have a lot of aluminum and. Uh, cast factories. All right. Saltwater Life writes, what's your thoughts about wrapping your ski to protect the paint with vinyl? Is it a good idea? Uh, above the bond line, yes. Do not put a wrap on your hull. The, uh, the dynamic tension, the, the, the dynamic forces on the hull will peel that vinyl right off and shove it right in your pump like you'd never believe. Um, yeah. All right. Do, do, do. Boy. <laughs> Sorry, I saw Billy's comment. And it made me laugh to myself because I'm a moron child. But uh, Billy was answering a guy about a, about a tuner. And he says, can you look look into checking out Ben Herman? 
Maybe maybe look up Ben Herman performance. He's around Jackson, Mississippi. And I immediately went to Pee Wee Herman's Big Adventure where he's like paging Mr. Herman. Mr. Herman. Anyway, sorry. Uh, Greg Gaddis swears by a box stock 1318 Solus on 80-plus mile-per-hour GPS. Uh, Greg's been having some really interesting results. Uh, he tried the new Solus Impeller and actually lost a mile per hour. Um, now he's heavily modifying his GP right now, and he's he's trying to push the thing to 90. He really wants to break his dad's record. Um, I'm pretty sure that GP will do it. It's just going to take finding the right package, and then he'll eventually sell that package. It'll be on Green Hulk, Green Hulk store. He'll do a video about it, and it'll be on the store. And hell, Greg will do the installation for you if you want to bring your ski down and have him do it. So, um, you know, from the horse's mouth. Um, all right, let's see here. Ted writes, the only mod I would do is flash the governor to unlock the speed. How much does that affect durability? Actually, that's exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to a SCOM or a stock 8000 tune from Riva. If you have a Yamaha, that's basically uh, the stock 8000 tune is just getting rid of the governor. Otherwise, a Sea-Doo or a Kawasaki, all you need is a SCOM. It's a very cheap, a uh, very cheap part. And it's 150 bucks, I think. And boom, you're out the door. And it's completely ungoverned. So ho hopefully, Ted, that answers your question. Uh, do, 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 do. Tracy writes, I have a 2020 FX SVHO. It has been sitting a couple months in the garage. I started every now or every few weeks or uh, every few weeks or so. Is it okay to fog the cylinders instead of doing the whole winterization or should I winterize? If your garage is, is if your garage is insulated, even if it gets down to like the high 30s, if your garage is insulated, you know, it's where your washer and dryer are, it's where your cars are, whatever. All right. And or it's temperature controlled for that matter. And you're just out there and you bump it over a couple times. Um, I know people are like, oh, what about the starter? What about this? Ah! And they got all upset. I mean, obviously, if it's like five months of doing that, yeah, that's not good. But if it's like three months of winter, you're not going to hurt it. You'll be fine. You'll be great. You'll be swell. You'll be grand. All right. You'll have the whole world in your hand. Uh, all right. Fog it. Start it before you ride it again with the old plugs to burn all the fogging oil and then install new plugs. Mike, that's a great suggestion. I, I agree 100% with Mike's suggestion. All right. Um, guys, I'm at a buck 58 here. I think we're pretty much done. I don't think I got a new super chat. Um, John Cunningham. Is there anything, is there any such thing as a twist throttle for PwC? My hand goes to sleep. No, because it's a terrible idea. Everything's fly by wire now. You want to try to do an installation on it? Uh, no, no. The answer is no. The answer is no. Use your middle finger instead of just your index finger. Use your ring finger and do all of them. There's no twist throttle. Can you imagine what would happen going out in the out in rough ocean water with a twist throttle? You'll be ejected so fast. You, your head would spin around on its shoulders. All right. Yeah. Sorry, man. No way. All right. Guys, I'm done. This was fun. If you gave me a super chat, email me at info at watercraftjournal.com with what you wanted and your shipping address. If you don't, I won't hunt you down. And I'll give this crap away to someone else. <laughs> All right. But for the time being, I, I, I'm congratulations to all of our super chat participant, uh, uh, participants. And 
Make sure to check out thewatercraftjournal.com this week. We got some really cool articles coming up. We got more videos coming up. Uh, uh, the panhandle ride will be this week. We've got uh, the final edits of the uh, uh, watercraft of the year and lots of fun stuff. So lots of good content. Don't just hang out for the, for the Sunday chats. Check out the magazine. If you haven't already gotten your jersey, get your jersey. Um, get, get a blue one and then come back for another one. And then uh, what else? Buy a t-shirt and a hoodie and some stickers and support the magazine. <laughs> support the magazine. Uh, subscribe to the newsletter. What else do I want you to do? Uh, guy. Yeah, that's about it. Okay. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Have a good week. We'll see you later.